and I'm really excited to moderate the next 45 minutes. For those of you who are not familiar with RoboLunch, it's short and compact, it should be informative. It's always focusing on new topics for robotics and automation, on new players, and it's always during lunchtime. So we said also it's going to be very entertaining. That's a task for the speakers. We have a great program planned for you today, which focuses on generative AI, a hot topic, and we will listen to three speakers who are convinced Generative AI will bring the robotics and automation industry to the next level. Just to let you know, um, the RoboLunch is going to be short. So we have three short stories, short presentations, nine minutes each, and I'm going to be very strict. So nine minutes and it's over. Um, if you have questions, please do ask them. However, only in the meeting chat, um, the VDMA compliance rules apply and the event will be recorded. So with me today are three speakers. As I said, Rainer Bischoff from Intrinsic, Anne Nordmann from Neura Robotics and Markus Wünsch from NVIDIA. And yeah, let's start with the first speech. So with me is um, Rainer. A warm welcome to you. Um, Rainer is General Manager Germany at Intrinsic. Intrinsic grew out of X Alphabet's Moonshot Factory and was officially founded in July 2021. Intrinsic's and Rainer's mission is making robotics more accessible and valuable to millions. So Rainer, welcome to RoboLounge. The stage is yours. And as said, you have nine minutes to talk about generative AI transforming robotics and automation. Thank you very much, Anne. That was a very nice introduction. Hello, Robo Lunchers. I'm trying to talk about generative AI, how we are transforming robotics and automation with a side view on the intrinsic platform and use cases that we are going to work on with our customers and partners. And first of all, trying to explain a little bit what is generative AI. So Anne Wendel also asked me if I can give maybe a little um, introduction into the whole topic. So I, I digged out a few slides from actually from Google, from our sister company. And generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence technology that can produce various types of content, including text, videos, images, um, and also audio or synthetic data. So what is the difference between artificial intelligence then and, and machine learning? Because these two can be sometimes really easily confused. Artificial intelligence is a discipline, so something more, maybe very similar to physics, actually. And machine learning is then a subfield in this discipline. And AI itself is a branch of computer science that deals with the creation of intelligent agents, which are systems that can reason, that can learn, and that can act autonomously. When you're thinking about now ML, um, ML has a couple of methods that are being used that are also known like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, or reinforcement learning that actually train a model from input data. And also deep learning is a kind of subfield in this machine learning um, arena where you can uh, train a model from input data. And this is now becoming important because uh, deep learning is then also um, used for creating models that are enabling us to use generative AI. And so do actually the uh, large language models, which are also a subset of deep learning. So deep learning is a field of machine learning that uses artificial neural networks with multiple layers, hence the term deep, that they analyze and learn from vast amounts of data. So really vast amounts of data, many, many layers, and, and hence the term deep. Um, what we what we use with generative AI then is to create an artificial intelligence that focuses on creating new and original content rather than just analyzing or processing existing data. Generative language models learn about patterns in language through these training data. And then given some text, for instance, through prompts, they predict what comes next. And how this can be used now in, in robotics and automation is through so-called foundation models 
these foundation models are trained with a vast amount of data, not only text, but also image, speech, other forms of structured data. And one key aspect here is once you have trained such a foundation model, you can adapt it with your own data. For instance, with your application data, with CAD data or some other real world data, so that the downstream tasks uh, can be adapted to robotics and automation. The task that you are probably familiar with here, question answering, you have all um, used this probably, or image captioning, object recognition, this can all be adapted also to robotics and automation. And we have come a far away from traditional programming um, where people had to hard code rules, like what is a cat, an animal with four legs and two ears, to the where first wave of neural networks where we were able to just identify based on the data presented, whether it's a cat or a dog. Um, and now to the final wave or where we are currently at the generative language models or foundation models where you ingest in a vast amount of data into these models and are then able to answer questions um, like what is a cat and then the system is explaining to you the cat is based on um, the things that it has ingested and learned so how can we now make this accessible for millions of more users which is actually our mission at intrinsic and make it accessible for robotics and automation Intrinsic is building a platform that goes from the lowest real-time layers embedded software via the industrial edge to the industrial cloud. And through this platform, we are making available machine learning techniques, reinforcement learning, large language models, generative AI. And then the platform is also created in a way that whatever comes up in the future in terms of artificial, intel artificial general intelligence uh, can also be used. And this can all be used in applications in the industry so very much predictable, reliable, um, and productizable. And that is something that we do with the help of our tooling. Uh, and the tooling that we are building on top of this platform is called uh, Intrinsic Flow State. And this is a tooling that enables you to build solutions um, for manufacturing tasks. And we are focusing today on manufacturing um, because we also think it's a much easier way to enter this field with structured or semi-structured environments. Flow state itself is an end-to-end -end developer environment where you can build uh, manufacturing solutions. You are building processes which uh, on the basis of skills. These skills are small function blocks that encapsulate robotic behavior. Um, you can simulate the cell and end-to-end -end means just from the design of the robot cell to simulation, programming, and then also deploying it in the real world. Um, you can all do from within a browser-based tool. And um, where artificial intelligence comes into play is when you're talking about perception. How do we perceive objects in that work cell? They are using sensor-based input, uh, generate data and use that sensor and data um, to actually let the robot work without fixtures like it is used in a, in a traditional way. Um, we are also building flow state with many, many more users in mind. So I said that Intrinsic has a mission to democratize access to robotics and enable millions more businesses to use this kind of um, robotics technology and AI. And um, we have been lucky to be able to acquire um, Open Robotics and the Open Robotics teams joined us about a year ago. And Brian Gerke, one of the co-founders of Open Robotics is now our CTO. So we are trying to build bridges between the ROS platform and the intrinsic platform that it becomes easier for all these developers that already know about ROS, but also many more experts um, in domains, and especially the domain experts today that are not robotics experts, they can use this kind of new tooling um, to actually get access to AI. Also AI experts or Python developers, new roboticists are able to use now this platform um, and be able to program solutions um, for the real world. Some of the use cases um, that we are working on with current customers and partners. Um, one of the recent ones is, and actually that's a simple uh, thing that you could do now with robots, um, out collision free path planning based, based on these models. Um, and what the statement here of one of the solution engineers said when working with the platform, um, until now it took me several days to program these movements of a robot in a conventional way. So seeing this being planned within seconds is amazing and also giving a very constrained view. Um, this is in, um, an injection molding machine which very narrow and, and constrained space. So it was really cumbersome 
before, let's say, the use of, of this kind of artificial intelligence um, to program this machine. Um, a second example. One minute to wrap up. Yes, Komao is one of our um, key partners we are working with, and they are now using not only collision-free path planning, but also much of the sensor-based input like vision and force torque sensing for assembly operations. Um, another partner of ours, um, NVIDIA, here we are focusing on uh, using to determine grass points on sheet metal, such that um, the, the sheet metal can be grasped without the suction cups entering or uh, overlaying with the holes just to not to lose the the air pressure this is also based on on foundation models for various kinds of sheet metal and that you can then use this also in real production um, or at least in production use cases inspired by by our partner trump here where you can put the sheet metal from from the bin to the left hand side and sort them uh, to the right hand side and since we are running out of time just one final um, remark here on motion planning since we are a sister or a, um, alphabet company, we can of course also use Google DeepMind technology here that you see are probably familiar with AlphaGo, AlphaZero, and this has been used to create motion plans for multiple robots um, simulating here welding of a car body. I guess time's up, Anne, right? So, yes. skipping time the final up. slide and just going to the last slide. Happy to receive your questions. Always difficult to time this to exact nine minutes. Yeah, but you did very well. Thank you, Rainer. Thank you. Um, I see several questions in the meetings chat. Yeah, exactly. So a big applause to you. <laughs> I see several questions. So the first question is from Jose Francisco Science, and he's asking: Have the skills to be used in flow state been defined at some point? Yes, you are you are actually getting these skills from a catalog of skills. Um, currently, these skills are mostly defined by us. So we also say this is first party skills. The reason is that the third party user journeys or developer journeys are not fully built yet. But of course, there is um, some of our partners are already creating skills but themselves are adding them um, to the catalog and can use them. So but you have to predefine them uh, before runtime, if this is a question. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And another non-technical, and uh, another question is, how does a non-technical person get digital models of their physical system into your simulation tool? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Um, of course, you, there are technologies available that you could, could scan whatever physical object you have and create a 3D model. But uh, at the key or at the heart of our, of our platform, there's a digital twin. So without this digital twin, you would not be able to work first in simulation and then deploy to the real world and also optimize based on this digital twin. So that's a, that's a key requirement that you have this kind of uh, data available. And there's methods available that you can digitize um, physical models. Um, it's not part of our platform, but, but this exists. Thank you. So I might allow one further question. So that's from Rafik Iqbal, real-time robotics. He's asking, real-time control is among the core technology and competency provided by robot manipulator manufacturers. Won't it be challenging to convince them to open the platforms to allow remote control by your system? So what we are doing is exactly, we are using a so-called streaming interface to the robot controller, to the robot OEM controllers. And the streaming interface is publicly available in, in, in various senses. And we are using the streaming interface to, to stream position values to the robot OEM controllers, and then they are executing with the robots um, the motions. And this is the only way, actually, how we can guarantee that the motions that we are generating are also executed like we have them simulated, um, also executed then in the real world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Rainer. Um, there are uh, further questions, but uh, I fear we run out of time. We will. Just um, an email. I'm happy yes, to answer. Yes, exactly. So you will receive Rainer's contact details. Feel free to contact all the speakers and ask them more. So thank you, Rainer. Thank Let's you. move on to our second speech, speaker. Our second speaker is Arne Nordmann. 
who calls himself a robotics enthusiast, and he is currently head of engineering at Neura Robotics. Neura Robotics was founded in 2019 with the goal to empower collaborative robots with cognitive capabilities. Today, around 170 Neura Robotics team members work worldwide developing key components, including AI, all with the set goal to revolutionize robotics. So Arne, welcome, and we all look forward to your talk, when and where to use generative AI. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, actually, we are uh, 230 um, <laughs> members by now, so we are heavily expanding. Um, but uh, yeah, so I want to reiterate on the question that Rainer already answered. That is the question, what is generative AI? And while Rainer uh, shared a lot of um, insights already from a technical perspective, I'm now zooming out a bit on a more abstract level. Generative AI is first of all for robotics, technological progress that we can use. We like, all of us like technological pro progress. It uh, made our lives more comfortable, uh, let us travel easier and uh, provides a lot of convenience to us uh, in the last decades. But uh, generative AI is facing a bit of skepticism uh, lastly in the public. And um, if you look at the reasons, well, when you ask questions, what would they like to do with their time if they would have endless time and, and resources? Often people would say uh, they would like to be creative, for example, painting. And if you look at generative AI, a lot of the examples we see lately is um, taking over this field quite rapidly. Midjourney or Dolly can um, now draw and, and paint much faster than you can do. And they can even mimic different styles of different painters in, in a way you couldn't do that. If you like to write poems or, or novels, uh, also this is taking over by generative AI now. Also there, um, they can produce texts much faster than you and mimic different authors. Same with music also and videos, also this is now done by generative AI a lot. So AI, especially generative AI, is taking a lot of things over, a lot of things that we love to do. What about things that we don't like to do? Take the example of taking out trash. If I ask ChatGPT to do so, one famous example of um, generative AI, it will tell you that it can't physically do that. What it can do very well is it can tell you how to take out the garbage. But that's not what we want to do because we want to get rid of these tasks. So we're arguing, and that will be what I'm talking about, AI needs a body. AI needs a body um, to, to be able to serve us. And being a robotics company, I want to talk about how does this body need to look like. Well, um, to take out trash or do other um, tasks, take over other tasks that we want robots to do. We argue they need the appropriate senses to heal, fear, hear, feel, and, and see, to perceive the environment. They need an understanding. They need the capability to make a, to, to understand the situation, make an understanding of what they are perceiving. And then we want to interact with them and tell them what to do. And that's where AI and generative AI gets interesting. And um, we argue that platforms, robotic platforms, need to be very powerful, more powerful than they were classically before in order to achieve all of this and, and use the full power of generative AI. And I want to draw a comparison to actually the smartphone. If you look at the smartphone and mobile phones, we started with a functional but very inflexible machine that was the landline telephone. It became more flex flexible when we had mobile phones. And then there was this fantastic push for a smartphone, which enabled so much more than just uh, calling people. And if you ask people what is the difference between a smartphone and a mobile phone, a lot of the people would say the difference is the large 
touch screen that came with it. But actually, that's not entirely true because we had mobile phones with large touchscreens before, but these were not smartphones. Only when all the capabilities were added into one device, the touchscreen as well as a lot of sensors, for example, GPS and a camera, and all of this became a platform accessible to everyone, so open for others to implement their applications. Then only the full potential of this device was unlocked. And opening this device was very important because if Apple would have decided to just write apps by themselves, that, that would have never uh, gotten us to the App Store that we by now have. And that's exactly the same thing what we think needs to happen in robotics and what we call cognitive robots. Integrating all the sensory that I need into uh, in, in applications, all the capabilities that I need in applications into one robot platform. And then open it up so that others can contribute uh, their apps for all the domains like welding and gluing and whatever you want to do with a robot, right? And we argue that this in the platform already requires a lot of an intelligence, and that is machine learning and AI and the sensors. All of this need to be integrated into the system and run locally. That is important for us, so that it's also um, capable to do that if, for example, internet connection fails or is not even allowed. And that can be on a whole different levels. Um, and, and make the robot have reflexes and work with all these nasty details that the real world has. And the robot needs to be able to understand what's happening and react to that so that AI can make use of it. AI can use the entire perception that is in the robot, the reflexes, the motion planning, the adaption to the environment. That needs to be in the machine and AI then makes use of it. All the applications can make use of it as Rainer said, being in classical programming or generated by AI, but by AI, but we need the powerful platform to enable this. That's what we are building into our robots. That's what we call cognitive robots as an evolution from classical industrial robots and cobots. And we have that in all different shapes and sizes. We have a cognitive robot arm. We have mobile manipulation solutions for industrial. We have a service robot, a humanoid robot. Important is that all these come with these sensors and the, the AI capabilities, cognitive building blocks inside and a one platform. What I, The skills that run the cognitive robot arm can also run and the service robot apps that are right for the household robot can also be transferable to the humanoid robot. And what do we want to achieve by that with all these robots, different shapes and sizes is that they can support us and allow AI to support us in all kinds of disciplines. And the, the reason now coming back to the beginning uh, of the of the presentation, the reason for that is that we think when we enable AI and robotics that they can do tasks that are cumbersome, painful, or even dangerous for humans when we can achieve that. Now robots can do that with the power of cognitive robots and AI, then humans will again have the time to do the task that we would like to have been done by humans instead of robots because of the social and emotional interaction that we want to have. That's what we're working on and that's what we think robotics and generative AI uh, will be able to achieve in the future. That was my take on it. Thanks. And I'm um, happy to hear about your questions. Thank you, Arne. Perfect timing. And I already see questions in the chat. So one question, where do you see the limits of generative AI in relation to human capabilities? Um, well, so that's a fantastic question, but um, I think we see that while generative AI is is capable of doing um, a lot of things that we wouldn't have expected it to do uh, just a few years ago, all of us know uh, a lot of limits that these machines still have because they are still tied to extrapolating 
and extrapolating into unknown territory oftentimes will still expose um, wrong answers or wrong details, inconsistent answers that is still still the case. And there is a lot of context knowledge that these machines um, still have to learn. And this is also why I believe that robots, the platform itself that the uh, generative AI system is using still needs a lot of capabilities in order to deal with errors that um, the systems on a higher abstraction level might still impose for a lot of uh, months and years to come. Thank you. Another question. What will be the role of speech recognition for applications? Are you working on that? Absolutely, and that's a that's an interesting question, um, also in the context of generative AI, because um, all of our cognitive robot platforms have a dialogue system and have microphones to to um, perceive the commands that I taught to them, and we have on our industry robots we. Um, industrial cognitive robots, we have a local dialogue system so that it doesn't only uh, will react to you if it's connected to the internet. Some of our customers and applications will never allow that. This one is working, but it's very, it, it is uh, to some extent limited because it's not online. You can't, if, if um, the system is running locally, you would never be able to ask it what the current weather is, but it is fairly application specific. So you will be able to tell the robot in its task, in its domain very well what to do. It will interact with you, but it, it doesn't have any knowledge of any live information. On our service robots, we have um, also the dialogue system that is connected to the open world. I can ask it all kinds of questions. And interesting is also the combination of both, right? And then uh, it gets interesting and, and our team is doing a great job of routing whatever you tell it to do, whether it goes to the local system with very task specific knowledge and not relying on any internet connection or routing to the to the uh, dialogue system that is available in the cloud. And the combination of that is very powerful. Thank you, Arne. Um, I see two more questions in the meeting chat. However, I fear time is up. So we will deal with these questions after RoboLunch via email, perhaps. So yes, always get in patience. contact with me. Perfect, great. So thank you again, Arne. Uh, that was very interesting and all the best uh, for Neura Robotics. And um, I see you have been growing lately. So work is, work is strong and demand is strong. Congratulations. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Let's move on to our next speaker, Markus. Markus Wünsch, Developer Relations Manager Robotics at NVIDIA. He's in charge of building NVIDIA's robotics ecosystem in EMEA. Um, yeah, well, I guess I do not have to introduce NVIDIA to you. <laughs> so NVIDIA, since its founding in 1993, NVIDIA enables accelerated computing and including AI for robotics. Uh, recently, NVIDIA founder and CEO Jensen Wang gave a keynote at uh, NVIDIA's developers conference, and I have to say it electrified all of us at VDMA Robotics and Automation. So many announcements on AI advances. And well, Markus, thank you and welcome to RoboLunch. Thank you for sharing your view on how generative AI will transform the robotics and automation industry. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I very much appreciate being here and being able to talk to you. So thanks. Let me get started um, on this slide. So maybe some of you are still familiar with uh, NVIDIA just in the context of gaming. So I want to provide a little bit of context, but not too, too much on uh, what NVIDIA is doing for robotics. Basically, we provide a whole lot of tools that you can use in your toolbox to build more intelligent robots. And uh, that goes for several areas of developing robots. So that can be in the just on the uh, simulated robot uh, where you don't have a physical system in front of you. You can 
during development stages already use different tools to accelerate your development time. You can uh, use third party tools, you can use NVIDIA tools, map and mix as you want, and then uh, tra train this uh, and use uh, AI uh, on, on several ways. And then also you can run all of this in the cloud. So for the compute, it can be simulation, it can be training, it can be runtime, and that also goes for, for the workloads. And I don't want to go into details on all the tools, but basically we have a lot of them. Um, if you look at generative AI for robotics, so this talk is not too focused on, on uh, general AI, but more the, the uh, generative AI. <clears throat> you can, uh, in a way, uh, look at it like transforming uh, one kind of input to another kind of output and uh, go between different, let's say, modalities and, and also c combine them. And for robotics, there's a few uh, areas where this is uh, relevant. I don't want to go too much, spend too much time here. There was going to be some examples um, following this. So generative AI can play a role across a whole bunch of use cases for robotics in different development stages. It can be in the, in the setup stages where you might uh, simulate your robot. It can be for, for training, uh, different kinds of vision, different kinds of motion policies for your robot and more. And then also you can run all of this on, on your robot. So it does not just have to be in the cloud, but it can, of course, and you can uh, find your best architecture. So for setup stages, I just want to be, give a few examples of um, why AI might make its way more to automation. Uh, basically, it becomes a lot simpler now. Maybe you're already using ChatGPT or some other types of generative AI, but uh, for the automation space, uh, they're a little bit, let's say, fast follower, I would say. And um, there's a, now a great time to use more generative AI for robotics and automation. Just a few examples here uh, is uh, you can create code for uh, uh, with GitHub Copilot for your Python C++ or whatever. and there's also already some examples of companies using this to create vendor-specific robot code, like KUKA uh, has shown at uh, Hanover Fair 2024, or you can use it to generate PLC uh, um, applications. There's also easier ways to integrate the technology uh, with microservices, stuff is open source, you have foundational models, you can use uh, different ways to, to program your robot now, where you combine LLMs with simulation environments and, and more. But uh, basically, it becomes simpler. There's a few more examples here. So uh, you can use LLMs to create virtual worlds. So if you have a 3D environment for animation or for simulation, you can uh, have um, code generated for you that is randomizing the environment, for example, different lighting conditions. You can tell the tell, uh, simulation environment, uh, generate a warehouse for me, and then it can give you a few scenarios. You can also interact with it and say, please adjust this. And um, there's one example that's similar to this here, where uh, Omniverse from NVIDIA is combined with ChatGPT, and you have a user that's talking basically with the 3D environment, and you can tell, tell it to create a 3D environment for you that you can then use for further development stages. Um, once you have all the uh, environments set up, you have your code, you have your simulation environment, um, you can then use simulation to uh, use physics related tasks. You can uh, teach robots how to walk, you can uh, test assembly tasks and uh, handle all kinds of uh, variations and scale that up and say, what if the part is smaller, what if it's bigger? bigger? There's ways to uh, generate synthetic sensor data in real time. Here's an example of SICK. They have cameras and they have lidars, and then the whole scene is interactive, and it's not just a video; it's rendered in in real time, and you can interact with the sensors and also test all kinds of uh, AI algorithms and generate the sensor data at, while you interact with the env environment. Generative AI will also come to the robots, so you can have it uh, either directly attached to the robot controllers uh, on the edge or have it connected somewhere. Some examples here are uh, that you can uh, program your robot maybe with imitation learning where you track what a person is doing or for AMRs for uh, autonomous planning. There's large transformer models which can uh, improve your decision making on the robot itself 
or for human robot interaction, you can yeah, talk to your robot. We had that example before. Um, one more example or one more slide on um, generative AI on the edge. So um, we can um, in the past uh, have good examples with state-of-the-art convolutional neural network models that are detecting uh, people in a, in a camera uh, image. And uh, we already see that the zero shot uh, foundational models uh, are using, um, are, have improved the output as compared to these uh, state of the art models uh, using transformer uh, architectures. So on the left, you can see an example of two uh, models and one is, has a lot more uh, accuracy and is easier to use. In the middle, there's another example where you can have text input and then detect what is happening in a video stream. So uh, there's no animation here, but uh, the model is also available uh, out there and you can uh, type in what you want to detect. For example, uh, a person, then we'll detect all the people. Then you want to uh, only detect the people using safety jackets, you can also do that. So text to, to video object detection, so to speak. And um, that on, on the right, there's um, and it just one more example of using clip transformers to search uh, images and videos using audio and and uh, and uh, text input. Yeah, and uh, lastly, to the end, I want to bring one more example of uh, how all of this can come together. Um, this is an example you can find on, on YouTube as well. I have a video that I will play in a, in a bit. Uh, it's from Figure AI, and it's a humanoid robot uh, interacting with a uh, let me actually already what I'm talking. It's a robot of a uh, interacting with a scene. You have speech interaction. You have vision AI. You have trained this robot in simulation. It's performing some kinds of reasoning. You can have a whole bunch of AI models uh, com combined. Where you have, um, for example, visual language action models, uh, uh, speech to text, and then. Uh, large language models for the interaction and, and a whole bunch more. Let me just play the video, it's like 30 seconds. Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it, so I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. All right, I figured uh, giving you Apple and cleaning up your, your kitchen is a nice uh, uh, example for the, for the robo lunch uh, during lunchtime. So thanks for the attention. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Markus. Um, also perfect on time. Um, yeah, fantastic um, example. <laughs> I'd love to have a system like that in my kitchen. Um, <laughs> um, let's see if there are any questions. There are. So the first question is from a sensor producer. As processing power is still expensive, how can generative AI be used efficiently? Yeah, so you need to second guess if you need generative AI or if you can already use uh, pre-trained uh, models. So for some cases, you might already use what uh, other people are using. Maybe you develop your own uh, systems and then keep them as is. But uh, I think what's very usable is uh, foundational models, which are for more targeted towards a zero-shot approach. So instead of everybody training their own chat GPT, you can just use this, for example, like a, a Llama, uh, or we have some uh, foundational models for robotics as well, for um, path planning, for object detection, and uh, grass planning, and more. And uh, this is very uh, simpler to use then. But the short answer is also, uh, in addition, when it comes to the compute power, it will grow over time. And uh, yes, it's always a trade-off. Thank you. So the second question, I do not see any yet, but maybe we can use the time 
to ask a question that is probably targeting all of the three speakers. It's about the AI Act and the new machinery regulation. So how is the AI Act and the new machinery regulation influencing your work and your use of AI in your systems? Have these regulations proved challenging? Any of you that would like to cover that question? It's a yeah, tough maybe, question, I know. <laughs> maybe very briefly. So if we as NVIDIA like to partner with industry experts who know a lot about this, but we are also active in the um, um, industry standards. For example, we're working on uh, safety uh, uh, with AI in the standardization uh, areas. So standards are important in, in general for us, And but the, the, the experts are clearly the, the manufacturing uh, companies with a long history on this. Mm -hmm. Anne, you also would like to say something. Yes. So, uh, very much aware and also taking part in the respective committees. Um, while uh, this act imposes some um, some challenges, definite challenges to the to the industry, especially if you combine robotics with AI, what we're heavily doing. Um, first of all, it's it's also very much appreciated that regulations are coming, right? Because up to now, robotics standards didn't know about AI, and this is only um, now just um, just uh, appearing. So up to now, uh, companies were a bit on left alone um, when when it comes to regulation of AI-based systems. So this is certainly helpful um, for the industry. And um, yeah, I, I think it would be very much appreciated if uh, the respective committees also give a bit more indication to the industry how robotic standards and uh, this AI um, act work together. But I believe this is also coming and, and gives more uh, confidence to the, to the entire industry. That is very much appreciated. Maybe also yeah. one sentence from my side. So definitely we are committed to speak with the policymakers. And I think through EU Robotics, and maybe some of you are aware that I'm also part of EU Robotics of the um, Board of Directors, the VP for Industry. We are working actively on, on commenting and working with the Commission um, on this AI Act. So thank you, Markus, Arne and Rainer to also call that question. Um, VDMA is also working on a position or has been published already um, some comments on the AI Act and also my colleagues in Brussels from the European office as well as from the VDMA technical affairs and standardization um, um, group, they are very actively involved in communicating with the, with the commission and with policymakers. So we are going to send you also, if you wish, um, um, some position on that. But nevertheless, um, time is up for all of us. I hope you enjoyed RoboLunch, the fifth edition. If you could please um, give us some feedback. Was it, uh, was it helpful? Was it insightful? What other topics you would, you would like to have us to cover for the next editions? Please feel free to share your comments. Um, yeah, so next Robo Lunch, we are going to invite all of you, of course, and look forward to the next Robo Lunch. But first of all, before we close this, we have one minute left. Let us all give a very warm applause to the three speakers, Rainer, Arne, Markus. It was very insightful. You also shared use cases, um, practice oriented. So thanks a lot. And yeah, all the best uh, for your future. And generative AI in robotics and automation, I guess we are just at the beginning and there is much to come. So, That's right. Thank thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.